Señor, colóquese un poquito más al medio que le vamos a tomar una foto. A ver, para llevar un buen recuerdo. A ver, ese grito. A ver, ese grito vamos a tomar. Listo, no se mueva, por favor. No se mueva, no se mueva. Ahí está, muy bien. Perfecto. Diez minutos enseguida vamos a preparar. For me, it was a far-off continent and a nation with which mine had recently been at war. It could have been Europe, except that the Cathedral of Lucan was only half a century old. And I was setting off to cycle towards the Andes, only a few hundred miles distant. west along the main road from Buenos Aires in the company of monster lorries stuffed with steers, with trailers that mooed and wafted a scent of manure down on me. The drivers had all the subtlety of a hippopotamus on heat and a tendency to treat me like the other hippo. I think it's because what Argentine men all really want to be is gauchos. <laughs> Every country is trapped in its own history, and the shorter the history, the more concentrated the power. Argentina is young, the history is still there, turbulent and romantic. There's not a man in Argentina who doesn't in some secret corner envy the gaucho. He broke in a valuable horse in two minutes. How he'd get on in a more conformist role like lorry driving, I'm not quite sure. Traffic decreased rapidly as I got away from Buenos Aires. Argentina is a vast country with only 30 million people in it, and a third of them hardly ever leave the capital, with its almost European sophistication. Outside, it's Hicksville and desert to them. They have a saying, God is everywhere, but his office is in Buenos Aires. And the first thing I realized as I rode on was that even this rich and developed part of the countryside was underpinned by social thinking that was, well, different from mine. I've seen roadside shrines in memory of accidents in other Catholic countries, but here they were very frequent and generally dedicated to the defunta Correa who was extremely saintly, because when she was dying for a drink in the desert in a slinky blue cocktail number, she continued to give suck at the same time. Given the manner of her death, one of the most suitable offerings to the defunta is a bottle. And given that bottles easily get broken, it soon becomes difficult to distinguish the shrine from a rubbish tip. And it developed the atmosphere of some macabre juju with all the mementos and significant offerings that people leave behind. It's like peeping into someone's secret thoughts. And those thoughts are surprisingly primitive and afraid. Thank you. 
I came to the town of San Antonio de Arreco, and I felt a little awkward. I wasn't yet used to looking at Argentine towns, which have a habit of hiding themselves away so that you have to peer into them to see their quality. Nor was I sure what sort of reception I'd get as an Englishman. Good, huh? You see, I'd hardly met any Argentines then and had no idea what sort of people they might be. When I peered into Areco, I found it was rather old and showed signs of having been prosperous even before Argentina's boom period around the turn of the century. It was a special day for Areco. There was an annual gathering with people coming in by the coachload from Buenos Aires and from all over what they call the camp, El Campo, the countryside. You could tell it was a special day, for they were going to put on most of the lights in the church. Not quite all, because though it is to the greater glory of God, it blows the town's electricity supply. It was there that I began to meet the Argentines. There was something familiar about them. The faces, the costumes. And then in the procession were two flags. First came the white, the blue and the golden sun of Argentina followed by another. There was green on it and white. And I found that I had crossed a wide ocean to foreign parts, only to find myself in the midst of the Irish. There were going to be six cattle for lunch. Argentines are compulsive consumers of red meat. And whatever the doctors say, one of the striking things about the nation is that everyone seems to have clearer complexions than I'm used to. Few social events are complete without a barbecue. And the hors d'oeuvre is likely to be meat as well. Though sometimes, as a concession to healthy eating, they surround it with pastry and call it an empanada. Oh, no. So there I was, almost entirely surrounded by empanadas, shamrocks, and looking for the Blarney Stone, and had no difficulty whatsoever in finding it. Hola. Very well, enjoying this fine Irish day. Yeah. Oh, look at this Saint beautiful Patrick. day, Saint beautiful Saint day. Patrick's miracle. And a mutual friend here. Uh, yes, yes. I saw you, I saw you in the church this morning. Oh yes, yes you're yes, right, yes, you're yes, right. Yes, yes, yes. How are you What's doing? It's a fine service, a fine church. Good. So, I, I had no idea there were so many Irish here. Yes, it's the largest uh, Irish community, third or fourth generation now, outside the English-speaking uh, countries, Argentina. Uh, we had a famous Irish chaplain, which is called Father Fahey. He's very well remembered here. He was a real father to the community. And he, was, he had been two years in the States. And he wrote back to Ireland, don't go to the States, come to Argentina. This is a prosperous country. The Criollos are, are, are very hospitable. It's a Catholic country, for, for, for the Irish was important. Yeah. So they drifted down here, especially from Wexford and Westmead. And he used to wait for the immigrants of the port and send them out to the camp, what we call the camp, to the country. Uh, While uh, the Irish in the States remain in the cities, New York, Boston, Chicago, here no, they went out of the camp. He said, go and start with a little flock of sheep. And that little flock of sheep turned out to be the biggest estancias in Argentina. You know what an estancia is? A ranch. Yeah. the Yanks called a ranch. But they were very successful here, you know? Yeah, so what he really said to them was, go forth, increase and multiply. <laughs> well, he didn't need to say that <laughs> to the Irish. <laughs> <laughs> if you're Irish, come to the parlor, they'll say, welcome there for you. And if your name is Timothy or Pat, so long as you come from Ireland, they'll say, welcome on the map. If you come from the mountain, Whatever you are, you're one of us. If you're Irish, this is the place for you.
As it happened, I met that girl singer again at a teeny party in the local country club. Well, not just a party, a little more perhaps, something of a ritual, significant. For one thing, it cured me of ever worrying again that I might meet an unfriendly reception from the Argentines. Though, as ever on such occasions, the girls were at one end of the room and the boys at the other in an agony of potential embarrassment. Men are awkward creatures at the best of times. It was Mercedes' 15th birthday, and in Argentina, a girl's 15th birthday is special. By no means all have the traditional middle-class ribbon party. It's expensive. But whether they like it or not, all are part of what it represents. Are you 15 years old? Sixteen. Sixteen. Did you have a party like this? Yes. yes. I, I am the sister of her. I see, I yes. see. So when you had your 15th birthday, did you have one of these cakes? Yes. Really? Yes. Ah, tell me about the cake though. What, what, what is in it? A present, like a present. Like a present? Yes. And which is the best to get? The, 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 the ring. The ring? Yeah. Why? Because it says that the one who have the, the ring we, is the, the one, the, the first who is going to marry. Oh. And so the older girls wanted to have the, the ring to marry. I don't know if it's the gaucho in them or just macho, but Argentine men aren't allowing their women to stray very far from the roles of daughter, girlfriend, housewife, mother. And at the ribbon party, this life is ritually choreographed for her as she dances first with her father and then with the other men in the room. I've never seen a society where a woman is safer or treated as courteously. But leave aside what the women and the men think about it. If you have a country in a perpetual state of economic crisis, it may not be a good idea to write off at a stroke almost 50% of your workforce and 50% of your brains. But the Argentines are often not inclined to think seriously about things like that. The Argentines are children of the day. That's their charm, and that's their problem. I'd met Irish Argentines, and I'd met Italian Irish Argentines, Mercedes family. Most nations are pretty mixed, but the Argentines are more mixed than most. Or perhaps they just appear so, for unlike the states, they have very little generalized culture to wash over their particularities and make them seem the same. For me, variety is a great strength in a nation, and for Diego Firpo too at the Estancia La Danesa, where he breeds prize Brangus, which are Aberdeen Angus crossed with the Indian breed Cebu, for plenty of meat but greater endurance. They do better on poor pasture. When they're going to the show, however, it turns out that breeding alone isn't enough. Well, uh, you want to know how we prepare a bull for a show? I suppose you do. Yes, you would have to prepare a bull, wouldn't you, in some way or other. Well, what do you do? Well, uh, for us, a very important thing is the hair of the bull. The hair? The hair. But there is an awful lot of hair on a bull. I mean, it must be an awful... Uh, to barber a bull, to, you know, to... to, to to, to cut the hair, must be. Oh, yes, we... You, you, you cut the hair? Yes, every month we cut it. Every month? I don't have my hair cut as <laughs> often as that. Yes, you know? because we try... Ah. We... Oh, he feels nice, doesn't he? Yes, yes very nice. Yes, he's very solid, very, very solid. Some of Diego's bulls are so solid, they have corners, on top of which they spray them every night to make them cold and encourage the hair to grow. An extra inch of hair can look like hundreds of pounds of muscle. For the show itself, 
they dry them again and tart up the tail. Presumably, the bull never knows or cares whether its tail has split ends. It's probably equally indifferent to the back combing, the hair lacquer, and the nail polish. It's probably enough for it to know that it's so solid, it's got corners. I would hope, though, that it realizes. Surely, anyone would realize, when it's being rubbed with mayonnaise. A substitute for hair conditioner, I believe. It smelt very strongly of it. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that if you've never smelt a bull covered with mayonnaise, you've never smelt mayonnaise at full power. And all of these things that you do to the bull, yeah. does the bull get to like any of it? I mean, do you find that bulls, you know, they want to have their shampoo or they uh, want to be measured or something like that? No. We really, really, I don't know. <laughs> we don't ask it. <laughs> A hundred and fifty years ago, the Pampa was an unfenced wilderness roamed by wild cattle, wild horses, and pretty wild gauchos. Today, it's cows and crops, and it's a toss-up for which is most boring to look at for hours at a time. You get reduced to counting the telegraph poles. One telegraph pole, two telegraph poles, three telegraph poles. Cheating, more telegraph poles. Today, even the grasses of the pampa have changed. There are many imported kinds. The air's rich with seeds and pollens. It's no place for anyone with hay fever. And according to Dr. Julio Maestegui of the Institute of Hemorrhagic Fever in Pergamino, that's not all. 40 to 45 years ago, suddenly here in the humid pampa, you know, the richest farming land of Argentina, in this area you are crossing by a very, very severe and dangerous viral disease Argentine hemorrhagic fever started all of a sudden killing 40 to 50 percent of untreated young male rural workers. Please come in. You see, this is the place where we obtain the plasma from people that cured of hemorrhagic fever. And this is excellent because it's the only form of treatment we have. I've never heard of hemorrhagic fever. Well, it's simply a, 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 an infectious disease starting with fever, malaise, but then all of a sudden, in 10 or 14 days, that's it. 40 to 50% of the patients without a treatment with this immune plasma are destined to die. It just happens? I mean, it comes out of nowhere? The virus that produces this hemorrhagic fever is harbored in nature. The natural reservoir, the hosts, are wild rodents that are found almost exclusively in rural areas of this humid pampa. Therefore, you see, since the virus is shed with the saliva, the urine, and it's also in the tissues and in the blood of these mice, the people, mainly the rural workers, become infected or contaminated, perhaps through the aerosols or the skin or the mouth. So you can just walk through a bit of long grass and get hemorrhagic fever? Well, absolutely. It's not that you can walk, you see, but uh, this is why I warn you since you are biking through this area, that you have to be, well, careful and be aware of the symptoms, because if you rest, you know, you never know where you can breathe some air contaminated with this virus. You may introduce a piece of grass in your mouth that is contaminated. So you must be aware of the existence of this disease. Uh, uh, and the symptoms? Well, the symptoms, as in any other infectious disease, fever, malaise, headache, muscle and joint pains. So, I mean, if I get a little headache, I, I mean, I, I actually, I have a little headache at the moment, uh, I, but I don't need to worry yet, do I? Because I've got a headache now, I don't have to worry now. No, you have to worry now. Because the difference, once again, you see, if the diagnosis is not established early and the treatment as well, you have 40 to 50% chances of dying from Argentine hemorrhagic fever. If you receive immune plasma, the treatment, of the plasma that is being donated by former patients, you are okay. So your work is really responsible for the fact that a lot of people just don't die now. If treated within the first week of illness, less than 1% die. This is almost unique for a viral disease. 
It's been Dr. Maistegi's life's work, not only to seek a cure for hemorrhagic fever, but to fight and wheedle and badger the Argentine bureaucracy for a viral research laboratory to set new standards for Latin America. I saw the rooms ready for the equipment and the equipment in boxes, but nobody and no money to finish the job. If they ever consider him for Argentina's fourth Nobel Prize for Science, he'll deserve it as much for his battles with the administration as for his research. There were almost no trees on the pampa to begin with, and therefore no fences, until the first iron wire was brought from England in the 1840s and began the enclosure of the plains and the transformation of the gaucho from a free hunter into a hired hand. It wasn't until almost the turn of the century that Peter Miles' grandfather began to fence his ranch at Venado Tuerto in between playing polo and cricket, for the family was and is thoroughly English Argentine. Was it a deliberate intention to make this like an English garden? I think that uh, gardening in this country has come from British tradition only and not from Spanish mm. tradition. So uh, really we are not landscape gardeners. We, we like a plant and we put it in the space between. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's why we just you know, have lime trees and bottle trees and everything. And of course, trees that people we, we, we like. Uh, for instance, uh, Prince Philip planted uh, that ginkgo there. Prince it, Philip? Prince Philip. And of course, here's the ombu. The ombu is very typical of Argentine, and it's supposed to be Argentine pampas, but it really grows uh, slightly off the pampas. It is not a tree at all. In fact, if you cut into that, you find it's just a, a roll of cigars. No wood there at all. It's not a tree? No, and so it's said to be the biggest herb. It's a pretty one. Mm. Yes, this is a Garizia. It's uh, especially in the spring, it's this color and in the summer it gets much darker. It was uh, planted not so long ago here by a friend of ours uh, from England, uh, Sally, the Duchess of Westminster. It's the second time she's been here. This time she planted a tree for us. But I suppose that's about five or six or seven years ago. It's ready. Would you like to follow me? OK. Thank you, um, Martha. That, of course, goes everywhere on a bicycle in this garden. <laughs> uh, I'm not much good at it. I ever fall off or I break it. How fortunate to have a garden which is big enough to go round on a bicycle. <laughs> How pleasant. How extremely civilized. We hope we get a good, decent cup of tea out of this. <laughs> is it, is it Argentine tea? Oh, yes, Argentine tea. And you drink mate also? Yes. Uh, mate, of course, was prohibited by the Jesuits because they said it took too much time. Yes. But uh, people like to waste time in the Argentine. I think that's one of the beauties of the country. We still have time to waste. <laughs> Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> It was before five o'clock in the morning when I met the gauchos, eating beef and bread and drinking mate before the day's work. Mate is Argentine tea, sucked through a strainer, astringent and green, yerba, the chopped leaf of the Paraguayan holly. <laughs> It's the great Argentine ritual, not a shop, a factory, a home, a barbecue by the roadside, where the mate gourd doesn't pass from hand to hand, sometimes for hours. They really drink a lot. One litro, two litros per day? <laughs> There's a ritual to it. The host offers it to everyone in turn, and it's bad manners to wipe the mouth of the strainer, called the bombilla.
The gaucho is nothing without his horse. It's traditionally the most precious of his few possessions. Knife, dogs, guitar, children, perhaps a wife. In the matter of affections, it isn't in competition with his wife. His wife is in competition with the horse. It gives him his stature, his freedom. The horse is usually a criollo, a descendant of the Spanish horses that came with the first expeditions and escaped to run wild over the plain, a breed refined in the early years of this century, rather small and exceedingly tough. The saddle is many-layered, with plenty of thick sheepskins for comfort. The gaucho probably spends at least as much of his life on his horse's legs as he does on his own. Twenty or thirty thousand acres of the Estancia La Barrancosa were owned by an old German Argentine family. My host, Karl Facht, ran the place with military precision while the gauchos were efficient in a more traditional way. Well, these people have lived with it. Most of them were born here on the farm, or if not, if they work here, they've been here for 20 years or a uh, long time, and they, they do this work you know, regularly every year, so they, they know their business. Mm. They, and it's in the blood. Is there something of, in, of, of that as well? Well, definitely. They've, you know, they've continued working here, sons and grandchildren, and three generations, four generations, and they're definitely uh, capable, very capable. And I don't know if it's in the blood, but it's, they're, they're good at it, at least. Are they the same as um, North American cowboys? Well, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if you can compare them. They probably do the same. The work is exactly the same. The work that has to be done is the same. Uh, I would say these people have more skill. And a different character. I mean, certainly not like the conventional cowboy we see in a Western. No, they're, they're a personality. They, they have, most of them have a very strong personality, very sensitive. I mean, they're very easy and very difficult to work with at the, at the same time. The Argentine gaucho will get uh, offended very easily at the wrong word, and uh, it, will, it will take them a long time to, let's say, to, to make up again. Perhaps one of the reasons for the sensitivity is that long ago, the origin of the gaucho was the half-breed the child without a place in the Indian or Spanish communities. The outcast of the plains never seems to have lost the feelings of that lonely child, nor sometimes the cruelty of a child. His first way of life was brutal, a hunter of wild cattle who'd slaughter for a hide and a meal and leave the rest to rot a nomad without a home and without the affections of a home. Even today, there are gauchos who roam from ranch to ranch, getting hired, paid, drunk and fired, month by month, year by year. That was the freedom left to him after the fences went up on the pamper. The gaucho is the folk hero of Argentina. He's deeply loved. Even in Buenos Aires, to call someone gaucho is praise indeed. It means they're the sort of generous and open character who'd do anything to help you. The gaucho's popular because he's so helplessly human. And he's just the sort of person the Argentines of the city are not, a hard-living pioneer.
To the gaucho, the thing that's most rico, delicious, is meat. He eats little else, and the calves he works with appear on his plate in some form or other at every meal. At La Barrancosa, the standard meat ration is almost 70 pounds per family per month. As lunchtime drew on, I was distressed to see that the menu included bits of calf I hadn't encountered in the restaurants. The gauchos of the Pampa have a folk culture which is different from those of other areas and which is alive even as close to the capital city as San Antonio de Reco where they come together for the day of tradition. There's a ritual, sometimes competitive quality about the performances, some of which may even be improvised. The songs range from the nostalgic and sentimental to intense exhortations of good advice and homespun morality. Soy bastante refaroso. Soy bastante refaroso para que me rayen el cuero. Soy manso como un cordero tigre para quien me desaire. La cabo amarillo chaire, si cree que no me atrevo, que soy pollo de tus huevos, provincia de Buenos Aires. No ando llorando miseria. No ando llorando miseria, ni cobro para cantarla. Siempre preferí aliviarla y otro la hacen despreciable. Con un precio incalculable están con la panza llena. No marca chiflo tus penas, provincia de Buenos Aires. No hemos nacido culebra. No hemos nacido culebra, los pámpanos son serviles. Conozco a ciertos retiles de alpargata despreciable que se arrastran miserable y andan calanteando el cielo. Eso no son de tus huevos, provincia de Buenos Aires. Yo soy como Cueva Zorro. Yo soy como cueva de zorro, no me tuerce la mentira. Y soy como asado de tira que no le hace mal a nadie. No quiero nada de balde y lo que mío lo quiero por argentino y surero, provincia de Buenos Aires. It's not just entertainment. This is a community formerly using songs and poems to reinforce its traditional values. The story of a mother's death isn't only sentimental, but moral. Que la mamá iba a tener una muerte verdadera. Que Ancina a Dios le pidiera que pronto se la llevara. Pa que antes que se cortara la pobre no padeciera. Venite en mano de seguida. Que es algo medio bichoco. Y solo, y solo apurando un poco, puede que la haces con vida. Perdoná la despedida tan de pronto y apurada, pero está tan atrasada la pobrecita de mamá, que yo del lado de su cama no quiero irme para nada. Es el mago que más quiero. Pride, the wounding of that pride and loneliness, lie at the heart of the gaucho. Oh, 
los días del año Estoy viendo tu figura Sabiendo que me haces daño Te ríes de mi amargura The gauchos were never gunmen, they were too poor. Their weapon, their tool, and their companion was the knife. Some fought for freedom with it against Spanish rule. Some used it to cut throats for Argentina's greatest tyrant, Rosas, and to dine afterwards. <laughs> Why there aren't more noseless gauchos, it's difficult to understand. But if you're a tenderfoot, you're a tenderfoot. And you might as well put up with it. I was sad to lose my association with the gauchos, for I fell for them just as much as everyone else in Argentina. But you can see that some of the attitudes they represent may not be in harmony with the needs of a modern nation whose survival depends on an educated workforce sticking to the daily grind. All nations are the prisoners of their history, and Argentina's contains not only a cheerful indifference to responsibility, but also state terrorism and violence. Often the scene is so peaceful and the people so friendly that it's difficult to imagine that Argentina has any political division at all. But the country's recent past tells you otherwise. In the beautiful Sierras of Cordoba, to which I climbed at last from the plain, is a town which is in some ways the embodiment of Argentina's last gasp of prosperity back in the 50s. In Balsa is the work of President Perón and the Eva Perón Foundation. It has a dam for electricity and a lake, a nuclear power plant for more electricity and prestige, and in the town itself, good but unromantically named accommodation for workers' holidays. Perón saw the way ahead in the National Socialism of Mussolini. He first came to power in the 1940s, and his regimes were a combination of grandiose ambitions, repressions, and social reforms. He and Eva encouraged welfare benefits. Today, people who have no need of such things complain that they began the draining of Argentina's economy. One of those who lived through that time was Beryl Slater. Well, in his first government, it was quite good. He did a lot of things. But in the second government, really, it was terrible. We hated it. Because if you weren't a Peronist, you were, you were sort of barred from everything. Terrible things happened during that government, which most people didn't know anything about, unless they were mixed up in it. And people disappeared and were tortured. That all came to light afterwards. But some dreadful things happened. It was a very horrible time, and we were very relieved when the revolution broke out in 1955. Everybody celebrated it, except the Peronists, of course. Is this nation mature enough to have a proper government, do you think? I think it's beginning to mature now. But that is really what is wrong with the country. It's not mature politically. Why do you think it isn't? Well, I don't think there's been enough, uh, there have been enough democratic governments. The young people don't know what democracy is. They don't know what freedom is. 
They learned what the opposite is under the military dictatorships that began in the mid-70s and ended with the collapse of the Malvinas campaign. Mimi Doretti of the Argentine Forensic Anthropology team has been uncovering the remains ever since. Uh, you look into holes, graves, where we uh, dug up uh, bodies of people who disappeared during the last uh, military government in Argentina. It's the one thing we know about Argentina, uh, that uh, there was this period when there was a great deal of murder. Um, and uh, it, how many people were uh, buried here? Eight people. Eight people. And how did you go about trying to discover what happened to them, who they were? Well, uh, when we arrive to a grave, we know we have a very big uh, suspicion about who we are looking for. We generally do a whole investigation that sometimes takes uh, two, three, four months or maybe sometimes a year. So what does the actual work consist of mostly? What happens? Well, we arrive from the cemetery uh, with the bones. Then we start all the process of identification in terms of stature, age, sex. In most of our cases, we have to reconstruct the skulls because uh, they have uh, gunshot wounds on, on, on the skull. And uh, so in terms of determination of cause and manner of death, we have to establish the entrance and the exit of the gunshots. And this has been very important uh, in legal terms because most of the cases at the trials, that was the official story of how all these things had happened, that there were shootouts between subversive groups and the army. And when we found eight skeletons exactly with the same kind of trauma, entrance on the back and exit on the front, the possibility of a shootout, it's quite impossible. What is it that drives you to do this work? Is it uh, duty or is it revenge or what is it? What is it that no, pushes No, it's you? not revenge. It's it nothing to do with revenge. It's just that uh, if, you, if you know something, if you, if you were so close that, that sometimes you can even say that not in my case, but you're kind of a survivor. That uh, you have seen so many things and you've been... I mean, we all the members of the team, we live in Argentina during the dictatorship. And we've seen so many things. We were... and we couldn't do anything during those years. So there was this uh, enormous necessity of, of doing something. You know, I come from a society which doesn't actually... Uh, hasn't actually had that problem and uh, I can't imagine what it's like to live in a society that does. I mean, what sort of things did you see? Well, apart from the most terrible things like kidnappings in the middle of the night and things like that, it affects also your daily life. They stop you in the street anytime they want, they ask you documents, they can take you in jail, you can just disappear for days, months and uh, nobody could do anything at all. Uh, you cannot talk, you cannot think, you cannot dream. Uh, it is uh, difficult sometimes to explain that, but we grow up on that. When the militaries arrived into power, I was 16 years old, and when they left, I was 24. It affects you in every single thing of your life. But I think that a lot of people in Argentina don't agree with this. I think that quite a lot of people in Argentina would actually like things to stay buried. Yes, for sure. At the beginning, when democracy arrived, there was a, an enormous hope and an enormous uh, feeling of, of, of justice for once in, uh, in our history of all these kind of uh, crimes. Now things are changing and uh, there's been all these uh, partial amnesties to all these uh, people, the military people and police people who were involved in all these, uh, uh, in all these things. We think that this is a, this is a extremely dangerous uh, thing to be done. The people who did it go on saying to everybody who wants to hear them that they're going to do it again if it's necessary. So do you have confidence in the future? <sighs> it's difficult to say. But we don't know. Few people I met on my journey had been prepared to speak as frankly as Mimi Doretti though many admitted privately to sharing her fears of a return to military rule. They seem to feel it as an ever-present threat, making them cautious about openly criticizing Argentine public life. 
It was the same with the other major problem Argentina has to face, how to integrate its extraordinary variety of nationalities. Everyone agreed it needed to be done, but few offered any solution. In fact, most seemed content to revel in their separateness. The beer fest is only one of the four annual festivals of the town of Villa General Belgrano, but it's the biggest. In fact, though the Lederhosen come from Germany, the beer is no different from the normal, though people say it is, presumably out of a sense of occasion. Argentines have a great ability to enjoy themselves. If the beer isn't exclusively German, neither is the rest of the show. The Scots community from Buenos Aires, but two of the keenest pipers are Italians. In a small way, the kaleidoscope of Argentine nationality is beginning to form patterns, though the nation as a whole has yet to get in step. The festival seemed to embody what I'd seen elsewhere. Argentines of every conceivable national background enjoying being themselves, but otherwise rather too cheerfully indifferent to the needs of their bankrupt country. All over Europe, barriers were falling, peoples uniting, while in South America, the Argentines, isolated and self-centered, seemed to be dancing to a different tune. Though Aitor Aboitis saw this more as an inevitable stage in the long development of a young country. Well, mostly what Argentina lacks is a sense of community. There is, the Argentines are great individualists, but the Argentines don't have a, a mentality of uh, doing things together. That's why they have not made a nation yet. I mean, you cannot expect society to solve your problems in Argentina. You cannot expect the government to solve your problems. You cannot expect the, the community in general. So we have this in, very individualistic attitude about our lives. What you really want uh, is for people to be more committed to the country. I believe Argentines are beginning to acquire a sense of, uh, of how democracy works. We have had free elections for the first time, real free elections. We are beginning to understand that uh, we have to work as a society, that we have to have representatives, in the society that, in other words, whatever makes a democracy tick. One day, perhaps all those different peoples pulling in different ways won't be a weakness, but a strength. What the Argentines have already is a love of life and people that makes them one of the most engaging, though scattiest, nations in the world. Also, a recent war to the contrary, one of the most peaceable. They've taken off the armor of those first Spanish adventurers who came purely to conquer and put on, well, a certain anarchistic innocence. <laughs> 